Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem Iskander. I'm a tech advocate with Cisco Learning and Certification. Hey, everyone, I'm Matt DiNapoli. I'm a manager of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Welcome to episode 53 of DevNet Snack Minute. DevNet Snack Minute is your 10-minute weekly all things DevNet, where we talk about coding, APIs, and just some cool stuff we think you might like to know. And what we're talking about today is better debugging for your code with our guest, Hank Preston. Hank, do you mind introducing yourself? Absolutely. I would be happy to introduce myself. Uh, Hank Preston, I'm a principal engineer and uh, kind of lead in, uh, architect with Cisco Learning and Certifications. And I focus on helping our internal data center administration and engineering teams uh, modernize, transform, and make sure that all those Cisco certification classes that you'd like to take are up and ready when you sit down to do your work. Sounds good. Um, can you set the table for us for uh, this, this debugging demo you're going to be showing us in a little bit? Yeah, so this is something, and I can't take all the credit for where this came from. Um, a, a previous Snack Minute guest of yours, Joe Clark, is actually who led me on to this idea. Um, and there's, a, I don't know if you guys do links on your, your videos or not, but there's a blog post that would be worth everybody taking a look at for some more detail on it. But the idea on this is whenever I'm writing Python code, I generally like to insert um, print statements or something like every step along the way indicating kind of where I am in the code, right? I'm about to connect to a device. All right, I've connected to the device and it was successful. I'm about to send this payload to this device. Oh, that payload was great. Um, and so my code ends up with like all of these print statements throughout it. And then at the end of it, when I'm ready to package that up and maybe release it for use, I, I end up finding myself having to either go delete all these print statements or comment them out. Um, and it's just not terribly efficient. I always knew there was a better way to do that type of kind of processing and logging and debugging in code. But it wasn't until kind of Joe wrote that blog post and I, I took a read at it and I was like, okay, now I get it. I'm going to figure out how to do this for real. And I just want to show off kind of that transition and, and how easy it is to kind of implement logging inside of your Python code. So I'm going to go ahead and share um, some code snippets and we'll look at the before and after of the transition. And so I, I hacked together just a quick um, script that what this is going to do is it's going to connect into a DevNet sandbox, one of our always on sandboxes using NetConf and then just look up some information about an interface. We're not gonna deal, we're not gonna go into that part of the code very much, but that's what the script is doing. And so this is how I would normally have done it. And you'll see kind of along the way, I've got this print statement, attempt to connect to this device on this port as this user. All right, so that it's gonna let me know I'm about to do something. And then afterwards it says, okay, let's print this out, connection check. Hey, look at that, did we connect successfully? And then I'm about to send this filter. So here's another print statement. Hey, was it successful? Hey, let's go see. Did I get a good okay statement? Um, if I have an exception, I want to print out an error and then probably stop things because we don't want to keep going if just the connection was failed. And then down along the way, I've got some more print statements. I've got this one where it's like the raw data that was returned, something I never want to actually show a user of a script. But for debugging, it's kind of handy to see the raw information. And then I format it. And then down at the bottom, this is actually what I want the script to show. Like that's the purpose of the script. And so if we run this initial example, so I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, Python, and we're gonna do example print.py. I set it up to ask for the credentials. So I'll put in my credentials here, developer and my password. And if I typed it correctly, it should go well. And I did type it correctly. So if, I, if we scroll up and we look at like the output, this has got those print statements in there. So we see attempting to connect, connection true. Here's the payload. All right, hey, it was good. Here's some raw data. And then down at the bottom, like these seven lines are what I actually wanted people to see. But all the rest of that was just kind of development process. Now I've done this before and then I just go comment those out and say, hey, here's a script. But clearly, there's, there's a better way to do this. And that's what this whole logging concept is about. I got to say, I, I appreciate you putting in your, uh, in your payload the, the username and password as an input and using get pass to mask the, the password typing. So I, I think that's pretty <laughs> awesome. Practice. <laughs> I've gotten slightly more sophisticated in my demo scripts over the years. Yeah, it used to just be hard coded. Um, yeah. I will admit, 
there's a reason there's a partial reason why it's like that that we'll see in the next demo and it's so that i can provide incorrect credentials during a demo um so it's not always kind of that fancy there's, there's a bit of an ulterior motive on that one but thanks for calling it out <laughs> all right so let's look at the the changes for this I'll, I'll circle back up to the top here in a minute on how we get started but the the core elements of the changes to do the logging model are, are really quite simple any place i had a print and then that print function before, we replace it with kind of a call to the logger. And so the logger is kind of tied into syslog. So it's got methods for the different types of logs. So you can see I've just got an info message here, just informational, I want to stamp that in place. Down here, I've got a debug message. Okay, this is, this is slightly higher, I want to debug it out, I'm trying to gather some information. And then we've got another one down here on the exception, this is logger.critical because you can treat different types of messages at different, different rates because it, uh, an error or a critical message, I may actually want the user to see that. I don't wanna hide that in a log file someplace. But that's the conversion really, is just kind of swapping all of the prints to logger dot and then whether it's info, warning, critical, debug, whatever you're after. And so if we run the script, kind of this version of the script, all right, I'm gonna split my screen a little bit over here this right pane that has no content in it, I'm tailing the log file so we can kind of see the data as it goes through. And so if I run our Python example logger.py, it'll go ahead and prompt me again here. So we'll put in the credentials and then we'll see if I can type the password correctly a second time in a row. Oh, no, I can't, which is actually good. So we will reverse the demo. I was gonna demo correct first, but we'll do the, the broken one here. So we can see I put the wrong password in. So that critical logger message actually prints to the screen here so we can see it. It's critical. We can see error, authentication, exception, authentication failed. I've even putting in the exact line kind of in the code where this exception came from, which is really handy. So now I know if I needed to go debug that, I can find it. And then over here on the side in the log file, we can see I had two messages. The, the error, the critical was there because we captured them all in the log file. But also there's that info message that just shows, hey, I'm about to try to connect. So I don't lose any of the context that I wanted. It's just kind of put in a place where I don't have to kind of clean it up later. All right, let's try again and see if I can actually type the uh, password correctly this time. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, it's all on me now. All right, it worked that time. So oh, now cool. what the user sees, it's really straightforward. It's just the information they care about. But over in my log file, I get all of that same context. And so I don't have to change the script when I wanna debug it if there's a problem. I just know that there's the log file there and it's gonna generate that information for me. Much better kind of development process because there's no like extra step when I'm ready to release the code to go through. All right, uh, we'll talk a bit more about kind of how to set this up, but I wanna give you guys a chance to ask any questions, kind of highlight anything um, I might not have, I might have skimmed over, so. Um, pretty straightforward. I, I presume that you might show us in instances where you can kind of turn those flags for debug versus info off, um, depending on how big you want or concerned about what the logs look like. Yeah, it's, it's fully customizable what levels of logs go to go to which which locations um, and we can we can dive into that a little bit. One thing, Hank, uh, that I've also, you know, if if you want to get a little bit more fancy than what you have put from a logging perspective. And we've, Matt has done an awesome episode about this, but if you play with the rich library, it has <laughs> a pretty awesome uh, ability to kind of take these different statuses of a log and display them nicely on um, in the terminal as you're printing them out too. So if you wanna showcase the critical one in a nice formatted with, with the, the issue at hand, Rich handles that for you. So you can integrate that with the current logging mechanism that you have in place. Yeah, when I build like actual CLI tools that are gonna be kind of packaged up, I, I often use Rich in addition to Click um, to build like a nice robust application that has a good user interface, the display looks nice. Um, there's a lot of those, those utility libraries for Python that make it pretty easy to build what looks like a pretty sophisticated and high-end script um, by a couple of code hackers like us, so. Yeah. All right, so up at the, back to the script here. So how do we, how do I setting this up? So there's a couple of libraries that we're importing here, logging.config and then logging. 
Now the logging.config library allows us to actually store our configuration for how we wanna handle logging in a separate file. We'll look at that in a second. And then the logging library is what actually sets up kind of the alternative to print. Now we're gonna have a logger to go to. Now, if you look at the Python documentation, it's really good. It walks you through how you could do all of the logger configuration kind of right in Python rather than putting it in a config file. Um, on our team, we found that we generally use the same logging configuration from project to project. And so we've kind of standardized what that configuration is. And then we, we package that with the code rather than having to kind of write the configuration in every script. And so if, if we look at our logger.config file here, um, it, it may be, seem a bit intimidating when you first open it, but if you look through it and you read it, compare it to the docs, it's pretty straightforward to look at. Um, kind of the, the big element you're looking for here is we've got our logger defined. And so this is what the actual logger is going to do. We can see that it starts out with no level set, which means there's no specific level being handled. Kind of everything would be um, addressed, but that gets passed off to the specific logging handlers. And I've got two here, one for console, and then one for log file. And each one of those handlers can have different configurations. And so if we look at the handler for console, we can see that it's gonna focus on level error or worse. So critical is worse than an error. So anything that's an error or a critical, or I think emergency might come after that even too, would print to the console screen. So users will see it as it goes through as standard out. And then my log file here, we can see that it's a file handler and it's gonna go ahead and just create uh, and append to a file called mylog.log. I've got it configured here that every time the script runs, just to keep appending messages to the same log file, that's the A flag, we used a W, it would recreate the log file each time. So pick which version kind of makes the most sense for your use case. Now, the part that I'm really glad Joe did for me so I didn't have to go figure it out was this formatter start stuff at the bottom. <laughs> and this is how you lay I out saw that too. What, what the format, yeah what the format and the syslog messages are gonna look like. Um, it's documented in the Python doc, so you can look at kind of how to lay it out. Um, I'm, I really like the one he put together because it gives me kind of the time that it happened, what's the level, which file did the message come from? And then I am a, a huge fan of rate right in the log message, giving me the function name and the line number where the error of the log message came um. from. Makes it really easy to dive right back in, understand what part of my code generated that log file. And then finally, the actual message that um, my log statement went through. And so by packaging all this in this config file, I can just drop this into any one of my projects. If you really kind of got super sophisticated, you could um, put it centrally and then have all your files kind of references as, as it goes through. But it's a nice way to kind of step up your, your coding, debugging, and logging as it goes through. And I've been a huge fan of kind of switching over to this for a lot of our projects. Really cool. I've, I've done some poking around with logging before, but not to this depth. And so the the formatter and actually the function name and non number, I was not actually familiar with. So that's yeah, really is, exciting um, to see. And uh, I can't wait to, to start adding that to my projects as well. <laughs> in good DevNet fashion, as I was preparing the demo for today, it's up on GitHub. I've got it in a GitHub repo with both examples. You guys can grab it. Anybody that's watching, if you want to have a nice starting logger.config file, go ahead and snag it. I even think I put a link to Joe's blog post in the readme, because again, I actually asked him before we, we did this video to make sure he didn't mind me kind of stealing all of his logging thunder and sharing it with you guys in the audience. But he said, ah, go ahead. He gets plenty well, of his own credit, so, nice. so. <laughs> yeah, He is. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for bringing his logging thunder on the show. Hank, I'm sorry uh, to, to cut you off here, but unfortunately that's all the, the time we have for today. Uh, before we let you go, though, um, we do ask our, our new guests this very one special question. Uh, what, super how, what superpower would you have and why? You know, it's a good question. It's an interesting one. And there's so many great superpowers. Um, I think the one that I'm going to settle on for today would be kind of um, limited um, ability to see the future, right? I, I don't want to go insane by seeing like all of the future as it goes through. But one of the most interesting superpowers I've seen used in different stories are folks that can kind of like read probability, maybe see the next five minutes or 10 minutes or, or hour in the future and go through. I can just imagine nonstop levels of trouble and fun and benefit that I could use if I had that type of a superpower. And investment in crypto. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, no doubt. 
Imagine high frequency <laughs> trading if you literally knew exactly what was going to happen, even in just the next one second to go through. That would be insane. Yeah, it would be nuts. All awesome. right, Hank. Well, thank you so much for that answer. That's a, certainly an interesting one. Um, snackers, go uh, check out Hank's GitHub repo. Go check out Joe Clark's uh, blog post on this topic and get started logging all your code so you can find out what's wrong with it and fix it quicker. Thank you so much. Thanks, Snackers. Thanks, Hank. Bye.